Welcome to another new edition of our monthly HKHDC webinar series. And today we are going to talk about technology and the future of Holocaust education in Asia. And joining us for this webinar is Dr. Stephen Smith, the executive director from the USC Shoah Foundation, who is the, one of the leading experts in the world on technology and Holocaust education. Uh, Dr. Stephen Smith is the Finchie Viterbi Endowed Executive Director of the USC Shoah Foundation, and uh, he is committed to making the testimony of survivors of the Holocaust and other crimes against humanity a compelling voice for education and action. He's also an adjunct professor of religion at the University of Southern California, as he's also a theologian by training. Stephen founded the UK Holocaust Center in the United Kingdom and co-founded the Aegis Trust for the Prevention of Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide. He was the inaugural chairman of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, which runs the National Holocaust Memorial Day in the UK. He served as the project director responsible for the creation of the Kigali Genocide Memorial Center and is a trustee of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation. In addition to his uh, many responsibilities, he is also an acclaimed documentary filmmaker. Uh, he has made um, uh, a very famous film called The Last Goodbye, and uh, which is sort of like an award-winning virtual reality film that transports viewers into the Maidanek death camp. And more recently has made The Girl and the Picture, which is an award-winning documentary that centers on a survivor of the 1937 Nanjing Massacre. He, uh, Stephen holds the UNESCO Chair on Genocide Education, and he is uh, engaged in lecturing around the world on Holocaust and tolerance education. Uh, Stephen is joining us from California today, and it's a great pleasure to have you with us here today. Uh, we're very much looking forward to exploring some of the new and exciting technology that uh, you and your colleagues at the USC Shoah Foundation have um, developed over the years. And I must say that it's like uh, HKHDC and the USC Shoah Foundation are embarking on a more permanent and long-term partnership project. And uh, we will see a lot more cooperation um, over the next few years that involves uh, moving some of the uh, cutting edge technology from the USC Shoah Foundation into classrooms here in Asia. So Stephen, it was great having you and uh, welcome. Thank you, Roland. Well, congratulations on 10 years. I can't believe it's 10 years. I think I was there in year one because it was when you were first founded that Sarah Greenberg told me about the founding of your um, center there. And I came to visit when I was up there for a conference with USC. And it was from there that I went with CC Chan um, and Sarah Greenberg to Nanjing for the first time. And so in a sense, it's like coming a full circle a, a decade later. It's amazing. Well, thank you for having me. Great. So I will now invite our executive director, Simon Lee, um, to kick off the conversation. Hello, Stephen. Thanks for joining us this evening. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, as we know, although there are um, no countries in Asia have mandated uh, Holocaust education, uh, there has been significant public engagement uh, with the Holocaust um, in Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, Korea, and of course, uh, China. And today we talked about uh, technology and the future of Holocaust education in Asia is a topic that has not often been explored. So first, Stephen, may I ask you, what has the technology got to do with the Holocaust? Because we thought Holocaust testimony is a testimony project, not a technology project. So, so what has the technology got to do with it? Well, you're absolutely right, Simon. Uh, technology is, has nothing to do uh, with what the Holocaust was or is and is not uh, an instrument in its own right that has any bearing on what we hear or what we do with what we hear. It is simply a tool to enable us to uh, allow us to go deeper into and learn more from um, the, the stories of those who are sharing their lives with us. 
But I think there's something important about to talk about the way in which technology enables us. Um, you know, people talk about new media as if new media is something that just came out this week. Well, of course, there is no such thing as new media. Um, there's just media and time and media changes over time. So at different points in time, you've got different types of media that you can use. Mm. So I was uh, very struck by a um, by a, a, an image as I saw, I was looking through a British movie tone reel mm. from 1945 at Bergen Belsen. We've seen the pictures on documentaries of bulldozers pushing the bodies and the huge pits and the, and the bodies being put in the pits at the end of the Second World War when Bergen Belsen was liberated by British troops. What I didn't expect to see when I was looking through those reels was a young woman come to a microphone. So she's standing with a microphone in front of her. Behind her are, is a, a, a mass grave full of 5,000 corpses. And she tells the story of her liberation from Bergen-Belsen. She just spoke for 90 seconds. And I realized at that moment that audiovisual testimony was born. It's the first time I'd seen anybody talking about their life to a camera, to an audience. Wow. That was new media. Heute ist der 24. April 1945. Mein Name ist der Hella Goldstein. Ich erzähle mein Belieben, was ich belieben, überleben habe in der Lage Birgenwald. That camera, which happened to be a British field photographer's camera, until that moment only took still images. And filmmaker Sidney Bernstein, who had turned up there to try and tell the story of what had happened at Bergen-Belsen, said, get me a microphone. We have to hear the voice of those who survived. So in a sense, what he was saying was, get me the technology. I want to bring this woman's story alive. That's what we're doing here. We're figuring out how can we use technology to be at the service of the things that we want to share. So you're saying that Holocaust survivors have indeed been using new media to tell their stories since 1945, since they, they absolutely, They absolutely have. And it's interesting because there's been this sort of assumption that Holocaust survivors, you know, were silent. People say, oh, Holocaust survivors didn't speak about their stories. Actually, what happened was Holocaust survivors were silenced mm -hmm. because they, in the 1940s, made many attempts to publish their books, to you know, speak out about what that occurred to them. Um, but at that time, the world wasn't really ready to hear. And in fact, that very film that I mentioned to you um, was uh, originally funded by the British government to tell the story of what happened. And then they decided, the, the, the Ministry of Information decided to close it down. And so the film was not actually fully uh, made available until 2017, and it was made in 2045. I'm just curious, Stephen, because when the survivors are, let's say, as early as 1945, speaking in front of camera, um, mm -hmm. as you know, when you talk to a journalist, only of pen and paper, they may share it differently, uh, uh, maybe more freely, I don't know. But if, if it's a camera, the way she speaks or she expresses herself compared to just an audio recorder might be all very different. So so, uh, so the medium, um, as I also recall, you, you mentioned in uh, some academic argument, the medium itself is the part of the story itself. So what do you make of all that? I mean, speaking now, we're talking about another new technology in our digital age. How do you make sense of this part? Well, there's no question that the way in, the way in which the story is told um, defines partly what the story is. Um, you know, for example, we find that if you sit down with an audio recorder um, with somebody who's been through a violent experience like the Holocaust or genocide, um, they'll speak, um, often with more candor than with the camera because with the camera you're aware of the apparatus in front of you and you imagine a particular audience even if i don't say to you this is the audience you you kind of create an imaginary audience in your mind and so you define your you kind of edit your story or define your story according to the uh, perceived medium and the perceived audience also, the environment in which it's taken changes what's said. You know, um, I've interviewed Holocaust survivors, for example, in their homes, 
um, and I've interviewed them at the former concentration camps. And it's a project that I'm still doing now is taking them to the sites. And of course, the environment itself um, is speaking because you now got that in the lens, but it, it also evokes in them um, a different um, a way of talking. For example, you mentioned on the uh, that Roland mentioned on the introduction that I've been involved in a film called The Last Goodbye. Uh, Pinchas Gutter, who is a survivor of the Holocaust, went to the site of his incarceration at Majdanek, and we filmed him there for several days um, in the barracks at the selection ground, places where he had been um, as a 12, 11 year and 12 year old child. Um, now, we could have filmed him actually in a green screen in Toronto mm. and said, Imagine now that you're standing in the barracks with the shoes. Imagine now you're standing next to the gas chamber. Um, and we could have placed him, digitally placed him in that space. But in fact, it was important that he stood in that space. So the irony was he was standing in the very spot where he was separated from his twin sister. He's looking out to the, to the selection ground and all he can see is what he saw um, you know, 75 years ago, but behind him is a portable green screen um, that we we put up in the field. And the reason for that is that we needed to have his um, his body filmed separately to the environment because we were putting it into virtual reality. And you need two different films. You need the environment, and then you need the physical body. Now, the, what we did though, we filmed it in such a way that he couldn't see the green screen while he was looking at the scene in front of him. And so the scene in front of him evoked the emotions of returning there again um, and enabled him to connect with the space with all of the feeling of being separated from his twin sister. But we also caught the digital image that we needed to be able to process it into virtual reality. Mm. And on that note, uh, Holocaust survivors are not um, resistant to new technologies. I mean, with this 360 camera or or the green screen, because I know you're not only just interviewing Holocaust survivors, but the Nanjing massacre survivors, other genocide survivors, are they in any way resistant to new technologies? Well, it's funny you should say that because um, when we were conceiving of the Dimensions and Testimony project, which are, you know, I'll show you in a little while, um, it, some of our advisors, including historians and others, were, were, were concerned that, you know, um, first of all, that we might not elicit the right type of um, answers. But secondly, um, you know, concerned about the uh, whether Holocaust survivors would want to do it, whether about their well-being and so forth. Um, quite the reverse is true. Um, you know, people who are in their 80s um, have seen the passage of time and how technology changes over time. You know, they grew up with the old telephone on the wall, you know, where they put the thing on and they wind it, you know, and now they have their smartphone and they're speaking to their grandchildren. So they know <laughs> that technology has a trajectory and they just and they also know they are limited with time and that their story is really important for the future. So they were very open. To um, to say, how can I use this technology to tell my story? I want to do it and I want to do it now. And mm -hmm. so they've, they've been very um, eager to be involved in the projects. Mm. And there's still a question I have in mind because when the Shoah Foundation already, as many uh, practitioners, educators in our field, you know, it's a huge, huge archive of oral history um, recordings with Holocaust survivors and, uh, and other genocide survivors that can be played for years nonstop. So, so what does dimensions in testimony, testimony add to this? Why is this so special with all these existing videos that are there already? So all of the collections that we have, you know, which runs to 113,000 hours, which means it would take us nearly 13 years to sit and watch it from one end to the other. And we'd also need to speak 42 languages to be able to access all the content, <laughs> um, you know, is, is an enormous repository. And each one of those testimonies matters, whether they're a Holocaust survivor, an Armenian genocide survivor, a survivor of Nanjing. Together, they are sort of a voice of humanity. I, I see it like a voice of human conscience, actually. Mm. And so, you know, we think of archives as being dusty shelves where you put books and now they're now digital, um, you know, uh, whirring things in which, you know, we place our digital assets. Nice. 
Um, but actually, I, I see them as a, a living, breathing um, a voice of humanity that can help us to navigate the conscience of our world. So when you take all of that together, you can say, well, why do you need to do any more? For goodness sake, we have <laughs> 113,000 hours. Why would we want to ask any more? So it's about the mode of, of engaging. So dimensions in testimony, the mode of engaging is the user, that is the, the, the learner is asking the question of the interviewee. What was life like before the war? I had a very happy childhood. I loved to be together with my family. And so um, that enables a different type of engagement to coming into an archive and searching keywords. And we'll, we'll look at both of these in just a few moments, how they work differently from each other. Because I can go in and I can find content in the archive using it, you know, typing and looking and segmenting it. It's a very different mode of learning for me saying, how did you feel when you lost your mother or whatever it is that I'm asking out of my curiosity. But then a mode of learning like virtual reality or augmented reality is one of immersion in which then the testimony is collected in a way that allows us to uh, see and experience places that we may never visit, but hear the story in the context of the place. And so it's a di again, a, diff a different mode of experiencing the story. Mm. And also the way to produce it then, I guess, because you've got to ask every question that can possibly be imagined on a wide range of topics compared to a two hour oral history interview. So, you know, a two hour oral history inter interview, um, which in, in, in the Show Foundation's archive is 2 hours and 20 is the average oh. across 5,000. So it's a, it's a good, good guess there. Um, the average length of interview for Dimensions in Testimony is 16 hours. Wow. Some, of them, some of them go to 25. Wow. So you have a lot more content because what happens is in a, in a linear oral history, like a, a life history, I as the interviewee may touch on the issue of say, let's just say it's going to be belief in God. Mm. I, I was practicing my religion as a child, but after I saw all that I saw in the concentration camps, I, I no longer practiced my religion thereafter. And it might be just a few sentences. When we do dimensions in testimony, we'll come at it from lots of angles. Do you believe in God after your experience? How did your belief in God change um, over, the, over time? Do you practice your religion? Have you shared your religion with your children? And so on. So actually what we end up with instead of three sentences about how their belief in deity has changed or their practices have changed, what we end up with is say 10, maybe even 15 completely different questions that access the same uh, subject matter, but from different perspectives. So it's a much bigger interview in the end, much more content. Indeed, and you also got to capture the individual survivors in a way that they can be uh, uh, lifelike in presence in, in, in classrooms. So can you share this new interview technology with us? Yeah, let me show you a few things about testimony. Um, if, it, if it's okay, if I go to the share here. Yeah. Yep. But what I'll do, uh, Simon, first of all, maybe I'll just show you, first of all, very briefly, um, where we, um, a few things about where you can find testimonies at the Shoah Foundation, and then we'll move to the actual technology, if that's okay. Um, so here we have um, the Shoah Foundation's website, and please do visit there. You can see there that we have a section on the Nanjing Massacre, and, and for, in terms of teaching about the Holocaust in Asia, not only teaching about the Holocaust, but also teaching about the relevant um, uh, subjects that relate to Asia includes the Nanjing Massacre. And the Shoah Foundation, we have quite a collection. If I go and show you the Visual History Archive, let me go here first of all to search. So if I go to the Visual History Archive, you can see there's 54,845 testimonies. They're not all available to the public, but about 3,500 are, and um, you're very welcome to, any member of the public can sign up to this and uh, find testimonies. And you'll see here lots of different archives that we've collected on the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide, the Nanjing Massacre, Rwandan Genocide, uh, we have some uh, testimonies about anti-Semitism today, which we've been collecting. And as you can see, it also goes all the way down. So if I go uh, and type in, let, uh, let's start first of all with, um, let's see, um, if I type in Auschwitz, 
what it'll do, it will narrow that down to 13,000. And if I mm. type in hunger, it'll narrow it down again to 2,000. And if I type in women, it'll take, narrow it down again. So now I've got down to just 1,460 testimonies. So that's less than 55,000, obviously. And now what I'm seeing is it's showing me the keywords um, and uh, it's helping me to navigate that. So when I click on that, it's going to take me now to uh, 47. It's going to tell me about camp hunger. So now I'm going to listen to Rose talking about that. Um, so let's try something um, that might be related to our um, area here. So if I go in and I search, let's do a quick search on uh, Hong, sorry, Hong Kong. Um, now I've got 38 testimonies that talk about Hong Kong. I don't know what they are, uh, Simon. I've not checked this before. I should mm. have done. Um, but now what happens is I go there and I can see where Joseph is talking about Hong Kong for whatever reason he is. Mm -hmm. And when I go there, I can then find that and navigate that. Um, I can learn a bit more about him here, about his biographical profile, um, where he's from and so forth. We'll just listen to a few seconds with him. So, I, for example, I managed and the next day at one o'clock, I left by boat to Hong Kong. That was on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I arrived in Hong Kong on a, on a Sunday morning. I have an address here. So it's taking you from those 113,000 hours right into that section when he's talking about that. If I then go in and I search, I'm, I'm being a little lazy here because I'm just using the, the, the bar at the top like a Google search. But if I go there and I put in Nanjing, it's going to take me to the testimonies that were in Nanjing. But I could search by name, actually. But now what I see is um, all of these people who were interviewed uh, as part of the project. And when I go into this um, interview, let's just find one. That's, uh, uh, there we go. This, this lady's uh, somebody I met in, in Nanjing that very first time after I came to your center. Mm. Uh, and um, so you can see here that she was, when she was filmed. And so she tells the story. Now you can see that our maps changed to being um, in Asia, and we're now learning about her biographical profile. And she she, she spoke for an hour look uh, in 2017. And the Show Foundation filmed 104 um, survivors of the Nanjing massacre. So um, they're all there in both Mandarin and in English. But maybe if I just come out of this for a second, and I'll just show you yep. how we went about this. So Simon, if I if I just show you this. Um, Brief show here. Look, this is the, um, uh, the the Nanjing Massacre testimony program that we did, and there's those beautiful statues of the survivors that are in the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Hall. Um, they're depicted. Um, but if I go uh, and show you, this is this is what a testimony would look like uh, when being filmed in Nanjing, China. We went to people's. Initially, we filmed in the in the Memorial Hall, but then we started filming in people's homes. The point being, actually. When they're at the memorial hall, they're speaking a particular way, and when they're at home, they're speaking a different way. So it goes back to the point you made that uh, where you give your testimony also informs what your testimony yeah. is. So um, this is the method that we chose here. Um, uh, I, Sha Shu Kin is, is well known um, as a survivor of the Nanjing massacre, um, but uh, we made a film with her, uh, filmmaker, Academy Award winning filmmaker uh, Vanessa Roth followed uh, the life of Sha Shukid in a short 40 minute film and you can see here there she is with her granddaughter and this film is all about passing on the memory to next generations and so it was actually about her telling her story to her granddaughter and in fact her great grandson who's just eight years old appears in the film too um, on his grandma's knee hearing the first words about her story. The reason it's called it the girl in the picture is that there's a very uh, famous picture of the Nanjing massacre where there's a little girl, two little girls standing outside a home. And when we were making this film, we discovered that she was actually the girl that was in that picture that many of us mm. have seen many times um, wow. and that she's still alive to this day. Wow. Uh, this is some of the team that were working on the, the program. And as you can see, there's a few, uh, a few of us that were there from the United States, but mainly this was family members and uh, people who were from Nanjing working on the testimonies together, which is really important. This is Nan this is in uh, Sha Shukin's home. Karen mm. Young, my colleague, was uh, there filming and also getting ready to bring her uh, for a very important trip because she came to make do her filming at uh, 
in Los Angeles. Wow. There she is. Um, in, in the late eighties, with a granddaughter who came with her. And, she stayed uh, for a week, so I remember. I, I recall reading uh, in the news. She stayed for a week. She did. She stayed for a week, and she was at the University of Southern California with us. She's wonderful. Um, and there she is with her daughter and her granddaughter um, in the set. Um, now you can see here she's beautifully dressed in her in her purple. But what you see in the background here, I'll just point these out. These little dots here are not pin cushions. These are actually cameras, and she was surrounded by 113 cameras that were filming her from all sides. Um, you can see there, like some are close up, some are wide, and the idea being that you can use all of those different viewpoints to assemble the entire image of her as a, a holographic, what we call volumetric, um, re, uh, re, you know, replay of her testimony. Um, and the studio that she was in looks something like that. So not exactly like sitting inside your nice, uh, cozy apartment, talking intimately. Your interviewer, you can see here that Chen is like um, 15 feet away from her because she had all these cameras around her. Um, but she answered questions um, for uh, five days, telling a mm. story uh, in Mandarin. And Do you so know how many questions are there altogether that were asked? Um, it's over 650. I, uh, actually, I need to check the exact number that she mm. finished. It's over 650. It's a, a lot of answers to questions. And mm -hmm. um, she did a remarkable job of, you know, to trying to tell, telling her story through this sort of Q&A methodology. Can I try speaking to the Dimension Testimony version of Madam Xia? You can. Let me just uh, come over here for some reason. We're going to be looking at this... Um, interview with Sha Shukin. So we saw her in her very nice purple outfit in the image. Mm. Now this is what she looks like when um, she's um, being processed. We're not seeing here the full 360 version. We're seeing just the front of her, but you can see it's a very vivid image. Yes. Uh, and the idea is that she can um, be portrayed life size in her chair in a classroom or in a museum. And she's already been portrayed in the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Hall in the exhibition there where you can see her uh, life size. But my Mandarin is not up to much. I'll let you answer <laughs> questions and we'll see how she answers. Let's okay, go. sure. Aji, you're a name. You're a name. I'm 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 a name. 一定要把这个当时我懂得的日本军的主义你有什么感觉我自己考虑是这样的这个日本人民呢他是很没有什么关系的但是跟我们人民是一样的他们也很受痛苦但是就是日本这个国家太坏夏一感谢你的分享祝你平安谢谢你不客气哇不客气不客气
technology. It's always uh, another angle that got not to be forgotten is vulnerability of it. I mean, the cybersecurity. Could this technology not be misappropriated? I mean, could it be hacked that putting um, uh, words into the survivor's mouth in the in this dimensions in technology that that uh, making Madam Sha or other survivors a pink is saying something different. Uh, from yeah, the of course, this is, this is a real concern. We live in a world of deep fakes and um, it's, it's not that difficult to do these days. Um, so we take quite serious precautions around that at the Show Foundation. Um, our, our main archive is highly protected. We have multiple content. We have multiple copies on multiple continents um, and they are completely disaggregated. So if one of our servers gets hacked, the others will not. And they're all master copies of the original. Um, we fanatically check our bits and our bytes mm. um, every uh, three months. Every file is checked. If we have any single one turns to a zero or a zero to a one across our entire archive, it is restored back to its original state. If the data tape on which it is stored has any degradation, the data tape is uh, thrown away and the file restored to its original state. And we can say with absolute certainty that the copy that we have to the one or the zero is exactly the same as the copy that we filed wow. uh, over 10 years ago. So you can so change that, it, you can fake it. You can change it, you can fake it. Now, what you could do, of course, is you could, you could take a derivative of that and change it, but we can always restore that back to the original. But let me tell you something that's coming. So there is a technology called blockchain. We're all hearing about mm -hmm. Bitcoin and Filecoin and all these different currencies. Mm. It's based on something called blockchain. Turns out that blockchain is a very good place to store and preserve your data. <laughs> so we actually have a, a brand new technology that we've created at the USC Shower Foundation called Starling. And we didn't call it, we didn't call it the Holocaust uh, collection technology because we intend Starling to be adopted worldwide as a means to encrypt your data at source on blockchain so that it cannot be altered. Oh, okay. What it means is then that uh, this, we, and we literally have cameras now that have the uh, middleware built into them so that when the uh, image is captured, it's encrypted for blockchain. And uh, what we do, we break up the, uh, so we take an interview, we break up the file into small little pieces, we throw it onto blockchain and no, uh, only the person with the key can reconfigure the interview. And so it's a very, it's exactly how cryptocurrency works. So um, it's a very, very safe way um, to keep your data safe for the future. And you can always go back and say, that's the original and no other version is true down the road you're now collecting lots of data uh, uh, and, and it's about what's needed right now but but technology always catches up and there are technology that we don't even know right now that would pop up and no one you know would foresee dit what we have right now i mean 20 years ago so in the next 10 years 20 years 25 years have so these first, considerations been put there hmm. yeah so the first thing is this is why the story has to come first you know, when we were doing the Dimensions and Testimony program, I remember sitting in a room to decide what technology would we use? Now, we did envisioned Heather, who was the, the originator and creator of this, had envisioned exactly what we saw with Shah Shukin right now. Full size, fully immersive, high fidelity, 3D image that you would talk to without glasses or goggles and that it would feel like you were talking to a live person as much as you can with video. But we sat in the room and we said, OK, Let's say, what's the least technology we could use? So I said, okay, flashcards. I write the question down, I hold the question up, the Holocaust survivor answers it. Maybe he even writes it down on the flashcard and gives it me back. Do I have the content? Yes, I do. I have the story. Tell me about your mother. And the person tells me about the mother on a flashcard. Okay, so let's, let's enhance that one step. So what happens if we do the same with audio? Now I have an audio recorder. Tell me about your mother. And I'm going to get now, I'm going to get the emotion and the inflection and the tonality of their voice. And that's going to enhance my perception of that. It'll be a different answer, um, but it'll be, the content will still be about the mother and the meaning of the mother. Okay, let's enhance that again. Let's put a camera on this. Let's talk about this on camera. Now I can see the person's face and I can get their physiognomy and their tears and their 
they're, they're, the fact that they're choking up as they remember what happened to their mother. And as a, as a visual person, I gain something extra from that. Um, I hear the tonality of their voice and I see how they're feeling as they're telling me that story. Okay, so now let's just say that's multiple cameras and I can embody that individual in front of me and feel the sense of their presence in the room uh, when I've captured that. Does that help me? And so we made a decision in the room that day that even though we could do it on flashcards, provided we are always focused on the content, not the product, not the platform, not the technology, and that we would collect as many different data sources as we could to capture that story of the mother, then we would be being true to the individual that was telling the story. And then thereafter, mm -hmm we would deploy that story in whatever medium we could find at the time um, and, and adapt to it. Wow. That conversation took place in 2012 before virtual reality and augmented reality mm. were a commercial reality. But because we made that decision that day, nine years ago, we can now play these, these interviews in virtual reality and augmented reality because we focused on the story and we collected as much data as possible and we weren't trying to make a product we were trying to enable them to tell their story the best way possible so which means um no matter what happened 20 25 years ago there's always uh, uh, these are future proof as we as we put it that, that... Yeah, and of course there's no such thing as future proof everyone likes to use the term and it's a good term to use and i'm glad you've introduced it here but we don't really know what the twists and turns of technology are going to be there are the futurists that tell us what it might be and for certain um we will we will be experiencing shah shukin's uh story in ways that we don't imagine in our living rooms where she will <laughs> Sitting, as we saw her just now in her lovely uh, pink outfit, she'll be sitting in our living room, um, you know, telling us about the Nanjing massacre as a, as a person from history talking to us in our own space uh, in due course. We have the data for that. Um, right now, those technologies, we can see them, we can see them coming, um, and there'll be ones that follow that and ones that follow that. But in the meantime, we're prepared as much as possible um, to be able to use these stories for a long time to come. Mm. And you mentioned uh, Madam Xia Xia Shu Qing, uh, she's a Nanjing massacre survivor. And uh, we know when we talked about uh, World War II in Asia, another important topic is uh, comfort women, the wartime mm -hmm. uh, sexual mm -hmm. slavery, important historical topic in China, Taiwan, Korea. And I know the new dimensions in, te uh, in testimony uh, uh, has a new addition when it comes to educational initiative with grandma, Hmm. Uh, as we all know, comfort, comfort women survivors, there are not too many now in China and Korea. So uh, we're racing against time. Um, and it was only a few months ago that there was a new DIT done with Grandma Peng. Can you tell us more about it, Stephen? Yes, well, I mean, there are literally, I mean, now I think we're down to single digits of uh, mm. comfort women uh, in, China. in China. Maybe even, you know, it's, it's, it's a handful the world over. Yeah. Um, who can speak to that historic, you know, that experience that they had as women who were sexually, you know, sexual slaves and um, sexually assaulted and raped, you know, day after day by um, the Japanese military. Um, Madam Pang is, uh, so Grandma Pang is one of them. Um, and so she spent several days um, and answered hundreds of questions about that experience, four dimensions into testimony. Um, and in mid-May, that will be available for us to start to share with a wider world. So I think it would be good as part of the series, uh, Simon, maybe to come back and share um, that ex that interview, because of course, um, it's really important that the, the, the experience of the comfort women is told um, for future generations. And we're very grateful to Grandma Pung for you know, in her old age for taking the time to make sure that story is told for future generations. Yes, indeed. And uh, when it comes to, um, again, different cultures in our region in Asia, in your opinion, what does, uh, how does technology bridge cultural gaps in terms of bringing Holocaust education, genocide education to global audiences uh, that need anti-hate education? Because on one hand, we talked about how technology can proliferate hate, but on the other side, you know, uh, what do you think about technology bridging cultural gaps? Well, yeah, so we're going to have a lot of tools available to us in the future, particularly around language. Um, and so I, I'm looking forward to the time when actually um, 
even better than we can now that classes of children across the world can talk to each other even if they don't speak the same language and really engage with each other. I'm a very big believer from a pedagogical point of view in breaking barriers down through encounter. Um, in a sense, what we're doing through these interactive interviews is we're creating a new form of encounter by which you, you know, you are driving the conversation, even if the person isn't there. And there's nothing we can do about the fact these people are 90 years old and over and won't be around for long. All we can do is try and retain that encounter the best way we can. I think we should be using our digital tools to create, um, rather than creating these echo chambers and these channels in which we get narrower and narrower, I would like us to see using our educational channels to blow that out and make it broader and wider. Get, get young people in Asia talking to Europeans and Americans and whatever, and not just because they want to go to America to study or they want to go you know, to Europe to see um, castles or whatever it is, but because we really actually want to meet each other and learn from each other. Genocide happens when people do not understand each other. It happens when there's exclusivity. It happens when we believe that our world and our culture or our echo chamber is the only one that's correct. And so I think if we can use our technology to introduce young people to each other, to learn from each other, to learn to disagree with each other politely, or to find out wonderful new things that they didn't know. And it may not just be about cooking and, and religion. It could be about the way in which actually we share very common values around um, you know, peace and security or whatever it might be, that um, we, we use this. The world is a very... Well, it's a very, very small place in the context of the entire universe. And we now have the chance with all, with all of this technology to make it as small as it really is and actually see each other. And people talk about the global village. We can actually do that now. We can all be connected. We can all uh, share common things. And I think that's what I would like to see happening uh, with our technology going forward, Simon significant topic. Uh, we have a few minutes left and before this webinar we received some questions from uh, different audiences in the region in Asia Pacific. So let me just um, uh, go through some of them. Uh, earlier on, uh, Stephen, while you were showing, you typed the word Hong Kong, uh, we see that excerpt uh, testimony and I, while you're scrolling down the screen, I spotted that the survivor was uh, liberated in Hong Kong uh, uh, um, uh, in the Shanghai ghetto. Uh, and of course, I mean, uh, many survivors, a, a huge majority of them did come to Hong Kong first. Uh, in fact, I talked to the uh, local reporter lately about that episode of history before they moved on to Australia, Middle East, US and other parts of the world. So this question comes from an academic colleague from the Fudan University in Shanghai. The question is, when we talked about the USC Shore Foundation, all this technology, uh, we, uh, the, he knew about the Nanjing part, uh, the survivors, and, and also uh, 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 some upcoming projects. But how about Shanghai Ghetto? Since we talked about the Holocaust, Shanghai Ghetto is an important part. It's the only international city which housed the most number of Jewish refugees, more than 20,000. Uh, is there anything sh Shanghai Ghetto related? Uh, for what the USC Shoah Foundation is doing. So let's just do a little quick demo in answer to that question and I'll talk about it. So if I type in Shanghai here, uh, we'll get 523 testimonies. So the vast majority of these are gonna be from, um, uh, to have experienced the Shanghai ghetto. You can see that, oh, John Sersinger. Very interesting, John Sersinger, an academic living in San Diego. I had no idea that he was in Shanghai, isn't that amazing? We all learn something every day. So um, these, these interviews are all there um, and you can pop in and, and search them. Um, it's also worth stating uh, for, uh, for our conversation today, uh, Simon, that um, uh, the Shoah Foundation has three films that are related to the region um, that will be coming out on a special website uh, that we'll be doing on Eyewitness. And I know that we'll be working together on this. Um, where there'll be um, a film called, uh, they've got the working title, Two Sides of Survival, and it looks at the experience of the Nanjing Massacre and the Shanghai Ghetto taking place just a couple of hundred kilometers from each other at around about the same time with two different sets of uh, communities infected in different ways. Uh, it's mm. a very interesting uh, documentary. It'll be out um, in the middle of this year. Mm. Um, the girl in the picture covers the Nanjing Massacre, and it's a, a wonderful film that was produced by PBS called Safe Harbor, and it's specifically mm 
specifically about the Shanghai Ghetto. So all of these resources are going to be available, and uh, I hope that our, our viewers uh, will avail themselves, whether they're in teaching in high school or uh, in university, to make use of these resources. Yes, and it will be in a, a hub that's easier to access for our educators in the region. And of course, this that's is our right. common goal our common goal uh, for educators in the region. Uh, this question came from a practitioner colleague from the Armour Museum, a museum on commemorating comfort women in Taiwan. The question is, what have been your experience with the response so far when we speak about DIT? Well, the response has been really quite uh, amazing. You know, we obviously had our idea that um, the engagement would be good. We worried a little bit about teenagers as to whether they would be respectful of the content um, and, you know, understand how to navigate it. Um, the, the results so far are showing, first of all, <laughs> that we see virtually zero um misuse of the system because we can see every question that gets asked it gets transcribed and it goes into the ai system so we can look at the logs we do not see abuse of the system they don't ask inappropriate questions they don't ask silly questions they are very serious when they approach this content which is actually very good to see the second thing is that we did some evaluation uh testing what experience there was with students that met a real uh, living survivor versus those that met uh, met, talked with and engaged with the video version. Um, and it's interesting, the, the educational outcomes are very strong um, in, the, in, in both instances, but for different reasons. Um, obviously, meeting a living person has a very visceral and effect that, that developed empathy for the individual. But it was also a barrier because we found that the students actually didn't quite know what to ask. They didn't want to offend the individual by asking something that was naive or you know, inappropriate. We found that when they were engaging with the video version, um, that, that they were much more direct in their questions um, and asked more complex questions and also asked more knowledge-based questions. So they came away with more knowledge and a more complex understanding of the history, but maybe not quite the same levels of uh, connection and empathy. So I think that's what one might expect, but it was interesting to see. Stephen, a question from Hong Kong, a colleague from the Education University of Hong Kong, who uh, seems knowing what the DIT is and, and, and of course been following what um, what's the progress. The question is what has been changed during this period of experiment? Of the, uh, what have we changed with dimensions and testing? DIT, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a really good question. So obviously this was a research program. The way in which we did it actually, to make sure that once we were doing the, them regularly, we knew where we were. So in 2012, when we started the project in earnest, we did a, a proof of concept. Then we did a prototype and then we did a pilot. Now, what that is, it's a typical kind of process for developing technology um, and also we were developing the methodology because we wanted to see um, how it worked. We would go in, for example, to the Holocaust Museum in LA um, and we would test the interview that we did in the pilot um, with members of the public long before we had voice recognition and holographic display. We would just go in with a TV screen um, and we would have all of our notes and a computer with a database and we would see what questions people asked. And then we would give them the answer based on what we'd filmed and then assess their answer to it. So all of that meant that when we came to actually do the interviews, it was nearly, it was two, three years later before we actually started in earnest. So our methodology was as follows. We have to do this really urgently because our, our subjects are 85 years old and over. Okay, let's take three years then and develop a methodology that will really work. And so that's where the changes took place. Subsequently, not much has changed because we really, we did the proof of concept very carefully. Thank you, Stephen. Um, a question from the Singapore International School. Let's say it's a teacher or parent, but the question is, why do we need a, uh, after all, technology of Holocaust education in Asia. Why in Asia? Well, I think this is really not so much about Asia. I think it's actually about the fact that we live in a global community. But 
um, we also see the world in different ways. We have different histories. We have different culture and language. I'm a very big believer personally in the localization of education. The show foundation doesn't do any program in any part of the world um, where we build the content in Los Angeles. We work with local partners to build content that's appropriate to the curriculum, to the student's worldview, to the uh, linguistic and cultural perspectives. Um, and that's actually why we ended up collecting a great deal of material around the Nanjing Massacre. Because if we go to uh, work in China or in, in the region and we talk about um, genocide, um, that's the entry point. That's the point at which people recognize what mass murder will do. And so, in a sense, you need to have that content there and collected as the starting point on a journey to say, well, we start here, but then let's look at what this means in a global context. And I think that's the way I like to think about this, that there are stories that we need to tell that are Asian and are, are necessary to tell because they happen in the region, but they should be the gateway to understanding the world writ large. And of course, uh, preservation itself is also very important. We are now in a race against time to make sure that the stories of genocide survivors, Holocaust survivors, Nanjing survivors, comfort women survivors, that their stories are preserved. And of course, Cambodian genocide is a topic we talked a lot about in our region as well. And that's also very important. It is important, actually. You know, it's been remiss not to talk about that. I'm glad you raised it, Simon. Um, the Cambodian genocide, you know, it's, we're now what, best part of 40 years later, and we need to really uh, ensure that it's in our narrative, um, but also to, to take the learning from that, including the delay of justice that there was after the Cambodian just, you know, genocide. It's literally only just been recognized internationally as a genocide. Um, and for the survivors of that experience, you know, that um, has profound impact on their lives to have that, um, you know, lack of justice for so long. So I, I do think that we need to be able to tell these stories in a, in a way in which we can share in each other's pain, but also share in the solutions that we bring through our educational programs. And on that note, I really look forward on behalf of the Hong Kong Holocaust and Torrance Centre, um, well, with technology, we talked about the future of Holocaust education in Asia, and I really uh, uh, treasure the time with you, Stephen, that uh, I hope down the road, in the months, in the days to come, uh, we work together about bringing Holocaust education in uh, these uh, amazing educational in initiatives in our region. And thank well, you, thanks. Stephen, so much thank for your innovation. I look forward to being in Hong Kong soon. Yes, thank you so much. Good evening from Hong Kong. Thank you.